Welcome back to the Double Egg. I'm one half of the show. Hey, Jai Picks. The other half of the show, the parlay. Joining me in to break down some UFC Sao Paulo. Let's get it. We are back with some UFC action. No UFC last weekend, but we did have the Francis Ngannou Tyson Fury fight. So at least we had that. It was a good fight. Um, but looking forward to some UFC this weekend. We're in Brazil, in Sao Paulo. Looks like we got 12 fights slated at the moment. We lost a couple. We got Jilton Almeida, Derek Lewis in the main event. Should be a good card overall. What do you think? Yeah, overall, a pretty damn good card. A lot of fun matchups. A lot of these uh, prospects out of Brazil we're going to see. And this is a fight night card where we have uh, somebody from Brazil in every single fight, which is pretty cool. I think the crowd's going to be rocking. It's going to be a fun um, night of fights there, really live energy. And I'm looking forward to it. I think we're going to see a lot, of, um, a lot of violence on this card, as I'm looking through it at least. That's what I see. Yeah, I'm expecting the same. Um, and we'll see how uh, a lot of these... Brazilian prospects come through. We got uh, some good matchups. Uh, we're going to go through and give you our prediction, our pick, a little bit of a breakdown in every fight. If you want the the bets, you can jump in the premium membership. The link is in the description for that. Last card, UFC 294. Uh, had a great night there. Went over five units on the night. So we're looking to keep that rolling. Uh, if you just want the plays for this Saturday, you can wait till Friday when they're finalized. Get the instant download there, or like I said, jump in the monthly subscription. Less than a dollar a day gets you every single UFC card every week. Other than that, any announcements before we jump into the breakdowns? Nothing for me other than, uh, yeah, that Hebovix fight falling off, man. That was looking, I was going to be my fight of the night. I'm disappointed in that, but yeah, I think we got a lot of fights that'll make up for it. Yeah, stay tuned. Maybe they'll get a replacement, but it uh, looks like at the moment that fight is off. Uh, it was going to be a great fight, but. Hopefully they can find a replacement. I want to see one of those guys, but let's get into it. Starting with the main event, Derek Lewis coming in. That's a plus 325 underdog against Jelton Almeida, who steps in at minus 450, over under one and a half rounds, plus 250 for the over, and a hefty price of minus 350 for the under. Jelton Almeida, undefeated in the UFC. Uh, he's bounced around between light heavyweight, a bunch of catch weights. Looks like he's trying to find a home at heavyweight. He's a big dude. He's jacked, um, but might be a little undersized when he's looking up against Derek Lewis, who is 38 years of age, but he is a big boy, every bit of 265. Brought out the abs his last time uh, against uh, Marcos Rogerio de Lima. Big bounce back win there. It was the last fight on his contract. Big knockout win with the flying knee. Uh, that was one of my favorite moments of the year because I had a big bet on Derek Lewis. Cash it as a plus 200 dog for me, so I was happy about it. But in this one, coming in as, in as a, a even bigger underdog against Jelton Almeida, you always got to be cautious of that right hand or maybe a flying knee up the middle. That might be uh, something he could land because Jelton Almeida always going to look to take the fight to the ground. Take the fight to the ground pretty dang early. Who you liking in this one? Yeah, obviously the, the line is super wide and probably for good reason. I mean, Derek Lewis coming off the impressive knockout. I don't think anybody saw the knockout coming in that fashion. Um, but, you know, this Jalton Almeida is a way different animal than, um, than Marcus Rogerio de Lima. I mean, Jalton so far in the UFC has looked dominant. Nobody's really been able to, to test him and, and really drag him to deep waters or really have any chance of even beating him. I mean, he's submitting or knocking out everybody. Jarzinho Rosenstrike, first round. Um, Anton Turkali, first round submission. I mean, everybody's just going out, um, you know, pretty early. But Derek Lewis is also a different beast than anybody Jalton's fought, especially as of late. I mean, Jarzinho has the striking and he and he's decent, but he's not a Derek Lewis. And then everybody else on the list is Park Reporters and and, and the Turkalis aren't even in the same realm. So that makes it interesting to me, especially when you're fighting a guy like Lewis, who is the most decorated knockout artist in UFC history. He does have that one-shot knockout power at any time in the fight. I mean, it could be the first 10 seconds, and we've seen in fights it could be the very last second. He's always live for the knockout. And we haven't really seen what Gileton looks like after a few minutes into the second round. 
I mean, we know Derek Lewis is going to slow down. Um, he's going to be a little slower as fights go on. But at the end of the day, that power carries through every single round. This is a five rounder. I don't expect it to go past three, three and a half. Um, but him being that live at any time just has to make you think about taking the dog. Like realistically, Gilton probably takes him down and um, there's a good chance he could find the neck. Probably doesn't knock him out. But, uh, you know, I look at Sergey Spivak being able to take Derek Lewis down and get that arm triangle in. I mean, I see something like that probably happening. But man, I just love Derek Lewis so much, and I love the power and the the capability of just putting anybody's lights out. So it's so tempting to take him. But you know, Gilton seems like one of these new breeds um, of fighters that are up and coming. Who is a heavyweight, but he's like a a, a slim, super athletic heavyweight. Um, so I think that could be a little too much for Derek Lewis at this point in his career. Gilton too. Um, you know, with the wrestling, the dude averages over six point four takedowns per fight at a sixty eight percent accuracy. Like this dude. It's not that he's, you know, such a, a great wrestler can get the fight down, but he's relentless with it. Like if he doesn't get the first attempt, um, you can damn sure bet he's going to try again and try again shortly. And sooner or later, you're going to end up with your back on the mat. And uh, from what I've seen, at least the top pressure is good. Uh, the submission game, the jujitsu, everything is good. He checks all the boxes right now. And, you know, the one thing I want to see, especially in this fight on Saturday, is how he looks after a guy like Derek Lewis is standing up time and time again um, to see if he still has that will to get fights to the ground or if he breaks a little and starts to get tired. Uh, so I'm super interested to see what happens. My pick is going to be Jalton Almeida. Betting-wise, you could almost guarantee I'm going to sprinkle on that Derek Lewis knockout because I feel like you have to at this point. Yeah, it's always scary going against Derek Lewis because, you know, it just takes one. And he's got like a majority of ways he's been able to find it throughout the years. It's like the uppercut, the knee, just the straight right hand. He catches you once. He has that ability to stun you to the point where you don't know what's happening. And he just puts it on you. And you're before you know it, like the fight's over. Um, it, he was on that three-fight losing streak. That one fight against Spivak didn't look good. Apparently, he had a bunch of health issues going into that one. Um, and he ultimately got smitted in the first round, taken down a bunch of times. Um, but Spivak is more of a, a chain wrestler type, going to wear you down, pick you up, and throw you down a lot of times. Jelton Almeida, not exactly that. He, he's going to go for the takedown if he gets it. He's got super good top control. Like The way that he can get you to the ground and you're just kind of a blanketed, like you're blanketed down on the ground, is uh, it's scary for a lot of these guys. We've seen it at the lower level when he came into the UFC, just easy rear round one rear naked chokes. Um, and then he fought Shamil Abdurakimov, who was a little bit thicker dude, got him to the ground. Abdurakimov doesn't have much of a neck, so that was tough. Um, but he ultimately got the ground and pound in round two. Uh, and it was kind of just the same thing. It's like gets you to the ground. You can't get up because he's got such good, good top control that you're basically forced to give your back or, uh, or just, just bank the round, like stay on your back and try to fight it off. Uh, and then against Rosenstrike, we're like, this is a guy who has good knockout power. And he's he's one of those guys, if he catches you once, like you're done. And he was able to get that takedown, which was uh, like interesting to watch because it's not it wasn't like a normal takedown, but he still managed to get it. He basically just like faked a, a left hand shot for the takedown. Rosenstrike kind of pushed him away. But he just grabbed the ankles, and it was basically over at that point. He got him to the ground and uh, got the rear naked choke in. So if you look at this one for Derek Lewis, I don't know if standing up is going to be the, the best way to go about it because if you just try to stand up, he's probably going to take your back. And Jilton Almeida on your back is not a good thing that you want. Like The explosiveness to get the takedowns is, is a main concern for me because uh, Derek Lewis against a lot of these – heavyweights that aren't as fast as Jilton Almeida like he can fight him off use his strength there but like Jilton Almeida is so fast and so strong that like once he gets in on a on a double leg like you're pretty much toast and I don't know if, if Derek Lewis is going to be able to handle that in this one Jilton Almeida is going to be the pick um I'm I'm honestly Intrigued to see what the the KO prop will be because I think Almeida could get him in a point where he's flattened out and uh, Derek Lewis is able to just not give up his neck 
Uh, he doesn't have like the biggest neck, but it seems like he's slimmed down a little bit. So maybe he's got a neck that uh, Almeida could take. But I think the TKO prop might be something I'm looking at. Uh, just get him flattened out and uh, ground and pound him out. But we'll see. I mean, like you said, Almeida hasn't been past uh, a, a round and a half in the UFC. So if uh, Derek Lewis can string this thing out, he's got a better chance early on. He's going to have to either throw caution to the wind and hope to land something, or he's going to have to fight smart. And I think both are not going to work out well for him. So I think Almeida is going to be the pick. And, uh, you know, it's always tough to go against Derek Lewis. Fan favorite. Everybody wants him to win, but sometimes it's just a bad matchup. I think this is a bad matchup. Co-main event. Nicholas Dalby coming in at plus 395 against Gabriel Bonfim, sitting at minus 545. Over under one and a half rounds, plus 115 for the over, minus 145 for the under. The undefeated, Gabriel Bonfim, one half of the Bonfim brothers, the only one that's undefeated. He's 26 years of age. Dalby, 38 years of age. He's 4-1 in his last five. He's on a quite a bit of a win streak. He's uh, coming in as a big underdog here. In his last fight against uh, Muslim Salikov, picked up a big win there. He was an underdog in that one. And uh, basically, the way you're looking at his fights are like, he's going to wear you down. He is very active on the feet. Uh, he's durable on the feet. Never been knocked out. Never been submitted. His only loss has come by decision. Um, and he's just going to be in there and try to make it a dogfight. Gabriel Bonfim, super explosive, super good uh finishing abilities and never been to a decision. So, you know, there's two ways this fight could go. Gabriel Bonfi gets him out there early or Nicholas Dalby could stay around, hang around and make a bit of a dog fight with a line like this. Um, it's a little tricky because uh, you're getting one guy as a, a really chalky favorite with a lot of fi finishing ability and one guy as an underdog, which if it goes later in the fight, he's going to be more alive. So what are you thinking in this one? Y'all yeah, be honest, man. This one scares me a little bit. This, like, I don't know. I think this Bond theme is obviously the better fighter between him and Ismail. But um, just looking at Dalby, like you said, man, he's never been finished. He's never been submitted. He's never been knocked out. And if you watch this guy fight, he is there from bell to bell. Like, the dude has insane cardio, especially for being 38 years old now. Um, he, do he doesn't have a ton of power or anything. He has decent volume, but um, he's consistent. Like, he doesn't. I don't know. He doesn't, um, I guess, go away easy is the way I'm, the thing I'm, I'm, I'm trying to say. He's got decent takedown defense, but it seems like every single fight he's in, he finds himself in it at least. You know, he's not really getting shut out by anybody. He's racked up a fair amount of wins in the UFC. Um, but for for Bon Fim, I think he, not that he's looking past Dalby, but he's obviously the better mixed martial artist. He's in Brazil here. He probably thinks he's got a win in front of him. I worry that he comes in and tries to put Dalby out in the first round and just, you know, out. Maybe he's squeezing to death trying to get a sub, blows out his arms. He's got the body triangle in, blows out his legs, and then Dalby comes back in the second and third, um, still with that same pace and same volume as the first round, and puts Gabriel Bonfim into deeper waters in a little bit of trouble. I don't think necessarily Dalby has what it takes to go out there and finish this guy or, or even get a convincing win. But I worry about some, you know, just this weird uh, decision. Dalvi comes on, gets, you know, just has a really good second half of the fight and makes it super close. So uh, for me, Gabriel Bonfim will not be any in any parlays this week for me. Uh, you know, the price is insane. It's super wide. And for good reason. He's the better fighter. He's the younger fighter. He's up and coming. But uh, Dalvi just has that that factor about him where he makes every single fight close. So, um, But for, for Bonfim, too, I think if he can get the wrestling going against Dalby, which you know some guys have been able to take him down, controlling him is another story. Uh, but if he establishes that early, I think he's going to have a lot of success. Like the more you can wear on Dalby, or at least try to get him a little more tired in the first half of the fight, the better your chances are. Um, but for me, I, I just don't see in this fight Bonfim going out and finding an easy submission like he's done in every single one of his U UFC fights. I think this is probably his toughest fight to date. Um, so overall. I'll be watching. To, I won't have a bet on this fight, I promise. Uh, but I'll be watching to see if we get some kind of parlay buster here. Gabriel Bonfim's the pick, but man, I've underestimated Dalby so many times, and it's come back to bite me in the ass. And uh, I will not be betting against him, especially with this line. 
Yeah, Dalby's not like a flashy fighter whatsoever. He's just going to stay in there. I mean, he's a pretty thick uh, 170 or two. Like, you see him against Salikov. He's a he's a thick boy, and he's got good cardio. So it's going to be a, a tough fight if it goes longer for Bonfim. Um, part of me thinks, looking at this fight, Dalby's 38 years old. He's on a, a win streak here. Seems to me like the UFC's like, hold your horses here, Nicholas Dalby. Let's not go on too big of a win streak yeah. because uh, you're 38 and you're kind of resurging your career, but how far can you go? We want to get you against somebody that we think can beat you. I think Gabriel Bonfi can beat him. I don't know if he's going to be able to finish him like as quickly as he's been finishing these guys, but he's got the capabilities. Like His hands are pretty dang good. The, the only thing that scares me when I watch tape on him is his striking defense. But the thing is, like, Nick, Nicholas Dalby isn't, like, the biggest power puncher, so I don't think he's going to be able to catch him too hard. He might catch him a couple times and maybe make Bonfim rethink his strategy here, but the submission game is off the charts for Bonfim. Like, the way he can throw something in in a split second before you know, like, you're, you're going to be tapping. So I think Bonfim wins will be the pick for me. I don't really like the line too much. Uh, it's grown a good amount since it opened. I think it opened around like minus 300, minus 350. It's, I would expect it to probably keep growing. Uh, maybe a good live betting spot if you're on Dolby to wait after the first round and uh, go from it there because you might get a better price. But yeah, Bonfim will be the pick for me. Heavyweight bout, Don Tail Mays coming in at plus 150 against Rodrigo Nascimento sitting at minus 180 over under one and a half rounds minus 200 for the over plus 165 for the under the rematch nobody asked for but we're getting it anyway because the heavyweight division is uh scraping the bottom and these guys both three and one in their last five with a no contest so Dante Mays, you see the frame there six foot six it's got a good reach uh not cemento six foot two and and inching up on that reach on Dante Mays. You watch Dante Mays in the cage, or at least you look at him in the cage, he looks pretty dang good. But then you watch him fight, and you're like, all right, this guy is uh, not championship material, to say that the lightest. Now, Rodrigo Nascimento, uh, his first fight in the UFC was against Dante Mays. Submitted him in the second round. That was back in 2020. Since then, he had a, a knockout loss to Chris Dawkins, a no contest to Alan Badeau, and a couple split decisions to Alir Latifi and Tanner Bozer. Dante Mays picked up a knockout win his last time out against the 80-year-old Andre Arlovsky. Um, so he's coming off a big win. We'll see if he can pull it off here. What are you thinking? Yeah, Dante Mays, he looks scary. And he's six foot six, and he's got a long reach. And he's just a big dude, intimidating. But he gets in there, and it's like, where's the power? The power is like non-existent at times. Um, again, I mean, against Andre Arlovsky, you know, you get the finish. But Arlovsky's 60 years old. You know what I mean? And, and Parisian's a bad, not, uh, I mean, I'm not trying to hate on the guy, but he's not a good fighter. Um, he hasn't really had that fight where he just establishes himself as a legit, you know, contender or even decent fighter in the heavyweight division. Uh, you know, against like Hamdi, uh, I didn't think he looked very good. Augusto Sakai beat him, and that's when Augusto Sakai, um, you know, couldn't buy a win. I think he was 0 4 going into that fight, and Augusto Sakai has seen way better days. So those guys are going in there. And beating up on Dante Mays, um, I just don't see a world where he comes in there and just steamrolls or has a ton of success against Rod Rodrigo Nascimento. I mean, Nascimento is only thirty-one uh, years old, I believe, or he's going to be thirty-one here coming up in the next month or so. And when he gets you on the ground, like this guy for a heavyweight has good submission skills. We saw it in his uh, in, in his Dana White's Contender Series fight, and then in his first debut fight, which was against Dante Mays. And on the feet, like he hits pretty hard. Um, I, I like his striking and his volume more than Dante Mays's. I think Dante Mays just kind of gets a little sloppy with it and doesn't use his size and reach the way he probably should for being that big. Uh, the one thing though with Nascimento is that he does get hit. Like we see it um, in fights. Uh, like for example, Tanner Bozer. Uh, that was a pretty damn good fight. Rodrigo Nascimento had to resort to the takedowns in the ground game because he was getting hit on the feet and hit a lot. And he barely won that fight uh, with three takedowns and some submission attempts. So, um, but like I said, on the feet, I think 
uh, Rodrigo Nascimento, at least the judges will look better. He's got more snap on his shots. He throws more volume out there. Um, and, you know, if he wants to get this fight to the ground, I think he could have success there too. I, I just, if you can't tell, I'm just overall not high on Dontel Mays, never really have been. Um, I enjoy fading him. I, I wish this line would keep coming down a little bit to minus 160, minus 175. And I would honestly think about pulling the trigger. I just think Nascimento, full package, completely well rounded versus Dontel Mays' um, skill set. I would probably take Nascimento every single time. So, uh, you know, the one thing that when I was looking at this fight and watching film, I was a little worried about six foot six and Dontel versus Rodrigo, who's six foot two. But you look at the reach and it's damn near the same. So uh, there's not really uh, a big advantage on Mays' side, which makes me like it a little, a little more. So, yeah, I'm going to take Rodrigo Nascimento for the pick. Uh, definitely fading Dontel Mays. And I wouldn't be surprised if, if you see him get Dontel Mays out of there. <clears throat> I mean, we don't see Mays um, really get finished unless it's, you know, submissions. I think, who's the other? Oh, Cyril Gahn is the other guy who uh, submitted Dontel Mays. So he's definitely capable of getting put away like that. Uh, Rodrigo Nascimento has done it before. Probably going to have some confidence coming into this one. And I won't be surprised if you see him do it again. So I'm taking Rodrigo here for sure. Yeah, I'll keep it pretty simple. Now, Cemento's the pick for me. Uh, submission ability, I think he's got the cleaner striking, and he beat him before. I mean, he subbed him in the second round. I don't see any improvements from Dante Mays to buy me into the underdog spot here, so I think Now, Cemento pulls it off with a win, maybe gets a finish, maybe another sub. Uh, but, yeah, it'll be the pick for me. Middleweight bout, Abu Smagomedov coming in at plus 200 against Kyle Bahalio, sitting at minus 250. Over under two and a half rounds, even money on the over minus 130 for the under. Abus Magomedov back in action after the uh, the loss to Sean Strickland, uh, which ages pretty well, uh, but that was his only his uh, second UFC fight. And the other UFC, UFC fight was Dustin Stolzfus. So you go from Dustin Stolzfus to the middleweight champ of the world, you can see uh, why he would lose that fight. It was an impressive win over Dustin Stoltzfus, but nonetheless lost his last fight. Kyle Bahalio undefeated in the UFC, uh, and he's looked pretty dang good doing it. So in this one, he was a, a slight underdog to Strickland. Magomedov was, and he's coming in as a, a bigger underdog here against Kyle Bahalio. Magomedov did win the first round against Strickland, but uh, Bahalio has looked so good in the UFC that uh, I could see why the line is this way. What are you thinking on this one? Yeah, this is another one that um, scares me a little bit from the standpoint that maybe, you know, Magomedov, um, I don't know, maybe he was injured going into that Strickland fight. I mean, looking back now, it's like, okay, well, Sean Strickland's the champ of the world. He beat Israel Adesanya. It's maybe not out of this realm that he was able to do that to Magomedov, like in hindsight. So it worries me that, you know, maybe we're getting... Uh, a little down here on Magomed uh, because of that loss to Strickland and we're labeling him as not a good fighter. When, if you look at his other fights, like the dude is a legit striker. The good, the guy has some super good skills. He was able to take down Sean Strickland in that first round. Like you said, he won that first round against Strickland. I think in that situation, that's the biggest stage he's ever fought on. You're fighting a guy who's ranked near the top of that division. It's your second UFC fight. And maybe that, that was just a little bit too much for him. The, the moment the pressure got to him and he broke a little bit after so he figured out that, okay, I'm not going to be able to put this dude away, especially not in the first round. Maybe I used too much energy and Sean Strickland capitalized. I think this is one where Kyle is going to have a good chance to come in here and do what he does, get the takedowns. Um, and from there work, you know, look for submissions, ground and pound. But if he can't, if he struggles with taking down Magomedov, especially early. I think Magomedov is going to have some success on the feet. Like the dude's really, really long in the striking department. He fights well from the outside, um, even in close. Like he'll get you in the clinch and he'll do good work as well. And, you know, he's not bad in the grappling department himself. So I think this fight is actually super interesting. Kayo, undefeated in the UFC, has looked damn good, takes everybody down, controls them. Um, he'll find some missions. He's got some power. And then you look at Magomedov, who's one and one in the UFC, his only win Stoltzfus. I, I think people maybe are disrespecting Abus Magomedov just a little bit. And I think this fight could be a lot closer than people think. And um, man, I, I want to take Magomedov really bad. 
I think the grappling um, advantage being on the side of Kayo here is going to take him far in this fight. But I mean, I, I just don't see a world where where Kyle comes in here and runs over Magomedov, especially, um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I don't I don't see it. I got a weird feeling about this fight. I'm going to take Kyle for the pick, but uh, watch out for Magomedov here. Yeah, I mean, if if uh, Kyle decides to strike with him for too long, like it's going to be a lot closer of a fight than the line would entail because Bahalio is not a bad striker. He's actually pretty solid, but if he allows it to play out on the feet, like Magomedov, is, uh, he's got some really nice kicks, and the hands are, are solid as well. So that makes the fight a lot closer, um, but I would expect Bahalio to look for the, the grappling fairly early. The only thing that scares me is like in the last fight against uh, Mihal Olszewski because Bahalio stood and struck like striked with him with for the first round. And then the second round decided to uh, go for the choke and got it. Um, So that, that's just like one thing that scares me about betting this price is like, do you want to keep trying to prove yourself on the feet or do you want to pick up wins? Like, what do you want to do here Uh, for Magomedov? You look at the, the record before the UFC, it's a lot of can crushing. um, And his only win in the UFC is dusted solstice. So it's like, I don't really know where to price this guy at. So going into this one, I'm like, I think Bahalio gets the win, um, but maybe we see a good bounce back from Abus, and maybe he shows us something. Uh, with it only being a three-round fight, it's not like he's got to you know, fight for five rounds like in right. the last fight against Strickland. So maybe it could look a little bit better than uh, his last performance. Um, and it's not like Bahalio is going to have that that Sean Strickland style to be like relentless on you. It'd be like, you're not getting any breathing room here. So yeah, Bali will be the pick for me. Um, We'll see where we end up at the end of the week. Uh, I got to look into this one a little bit more, but yeah, he'll be the pick for me. Well, with, with Magomedov too, with Magomedov too, it's like you watch that fight against Stoltzfus and yeah, it ended early and Stoltzfus sucks, but the way he threw that kick up the middle, it's like that's exactly what he's going to be looking for with that kick and the knees, especially with Kyle trying to enter onto a single or double leg. Um, makes me nervous because Magomedov's athletic, and he he's the type that can land those shots. So, yeah, it's super interesting. I, I'm actually excited for this fight. Yeah, I'm intrigued. It was supposed to be Nursultan against Bahalio, but Nursultan pulls out. and we Would have been an insane fight. Yeah, that would have been a cool fight, but this one is pretty cool too. So, looking forward to it. Middleweight bout, Armin Petrosian coming in at minus 115 against Adolfo Vieira, sitting at minus 115 as well. Over under two and a half rounds, plus 140 for the over, minus 170 for the under. Armin Petrosian, four and one in his last five, three and two in his last five for Adolfo Vieira. The Brazilian fighting in his home country, taking on Petrosian. You see the height, uh, Difference there for Petrosian, but the reach advantage goes to Adolfo Vieira. Uh, Petrosian, you don't see, I mean, neither guys has like a ton of MMA experience, uh, but Petrosian, since he's been in the UFC, has only lost his two, Kyle Bahalio. Um, and in a lot of his fights, you see his kickboxing experience uh, shine because the way he moves his leg kicks, he's just going to be super high volume on the feet. Uh, he's got some good power, Adolfo Vieira. Obviously, the decorated uh, grappling and jiu-jitsu uh, specialist. He will look to take the fight to the ground. So, it's your classic striker versus grappler matchup. Who are you liking in this one? Yeah, this is like your... I mean, this is as, as striker, as grappler, as it gets. I mean, Adolfo Vieira, you know exactly what he's going to do. You know exactly what Armin Petrosian's going to do. Um, you know, at the beginning of all this... I was super high on Armin Petrosian just because, you know, on the feet, he's going to be the better kickboxer. He's going to be landing the more damage. You know, that's what the judges are looking for. And and then I'd start diving into the records and it kind of reassured that stance that I have. And I, I look at, at Hadolfo's wins and it's it's Cody Brundage and it's Dustin Stoltzfus and Sopperberg Beg uh, Safarov, who a lot of people probably don't know who are listening to this. And then his first UFC win was Oscar Pichota. So, I mean, he's not beating guys that you would you would recognize or that jump out to you. Um, Stoltzfus, don't think he's in the UFC anymore. Cody Brundage, probably getting his walking papers. The guy's not beating anybody uh, that, that is either in the UFC or is winning in the UFC. 
Like his loss is to Chris Curtis, good fighter. Anthony Hernandez, good fighter, but he's not beating any of those guys. Um, and, and it just makes me wonder if he's going to come in here and be able to beat an arm of Petrosian who beat Christian Leroy Duncan, which a lot of people were super high on going into that uh, fight. AJ Dobson, he beat, who just got a win in the UFC, who was a, a pretty damn good, well-rounded fighter. His only loss, Kyle Barallo, uh, who's fighting on this card too, we just talked about. Um, you know, that's a that's a that's not a bad loss. It doesn't age bad. Kyle's undefeated in the UFC. The one thing that worries me, though, is Kyle has that style where he's going to wrestle you and look for submissions, exactly what Hidalfo Vieira is going to try to do. I think Kyle does it at a more high level, the wrestling part at least. Um, but, you know, if Hidalfo does get Armin on the ground, I mean, Armin's not unsubmittable. And, and Hidalfo is damn near as good as they come in the grappling and, and submission department. So that scares me a little bit. But, uh, you know, at the end of the day, Armin knows exactly what Hidalfo is going to try to do here. It's going to be to take him down and submit him. I think Armin's probably been working on that the last however many weeks, months he's been in camp preparing for this. And um, it, it just makes it super interesting. But at the end of the day, Hidalfo got 22 takedowns stuffed by Chris Curtis. On the feet, he kind of got touched up. Uh, and, and Chris Curtis is a good boxer. But you add that element of kickboxing and, and the, the style that Armin Petrosian has, I think while this fight's on the feet, Petrosian will really put it on him. He'll land some good shots. He'll, he'll rip the body and come upstairs as well. He's fast. Um, overall, I, I like his striking a lot. And against Adolfo Vieira, I think he's going to find a ton of success. I'm going to take Armin Petrosian here. Uh, Betting-wise, I'll be taking Armin as well. But I'll definitely look at that Hidalfo Vieira first round sub because if it happens in this fight, I do think it's going to be in the first round. Vieira can get tired, especially trying to grapple the whole fights. Um, so outside the first round, I think this is all Armin Petrosian. Yeah, I like Petrosian in this one. The only thing that scares me is his career takedown defense in the UFC is 36%. The upside on that is he hasn't been finished in the UFC. He hasn't been submitted in the UFC. And He's never been submitted in his professional career. So if he does get taken down, um, I mean, it's probably going to be a lot harder to get back up on Adolfo Vieira, but that's the thing you got to worry about when you're going against Adolfo Vieira. So I'm expecting Armin Petrosian to come in here having worked some takedown defense the entire camp and uh, stay to the outside, use your kicks uh, on the legs, stuff takedowns the best you can and uh, dance to the outside. That's that's a lot of his style is fighting off the back foot, throw some kicks, throw your hands out there, and uh, just kind of work your way around the octagon and do some work there. I would expect that he could do that to uh, uh, Adolfo Vieira, who doesn't have the most uh, MMA experience, the most striking experience. We saw him get dropped by Cody Brundage in the first round, so I think Petrosian should get the win here. He'll be the pick for me. The lightweight bout, Vince Pachel coming in at plus 355 against Ishmael Bomfim sitting at minus 480. Over under two and a half rounds, plus 115 for the over, minus 145 for the under. Ishmael Bomfim picked up his first loss in a very long time, so he's looking for a bounce back spot here against Vince Pachel, who is 40 years old. And uh, he's looking to maybe save his career, maybe... Uh, I don't know how, how many fights he's got left on his contract, but he's 40 years old, and they're pairing him up against a guy that obviously they want to try to build and being it, or with the fight being in Brazil, he's a B Brazilian fan favorite. The Bomfim bros, all the Brazilians know him or know them. So uh, got a lot going against him here. Age, uh, wrong country he's fighting in. So I can see why the line is that way. And uh, the Benoit Saint-Denis loss ages pretty well he was a big favorite in that one too against benoit and got finished in the first round but maybe a bounce back spot for him big favorite do you think he pulls it off oh man this is it's another fight that's weird and and i would not be surprised if vince pichel at at i think he's turning 41 in november i wouldn't be surprised if he you know, pulls this off like i, I don't expect him to but i'm not going to be shocked if he does and that's because you look at it him and he's like quietly seven and two in the UFC. I don't think you'd ever guess that Vince Pichel is seven and two in the UFC. His last three wins: Austin Hubbard, Jim Miller, Roosevelt Roberts. You saw Roberts and Hubbard on this last season of the Ultimate Fighter, and obviously Jim Miller's an absolute legend who's still crushing dudes. So those are three good wins. 
and, and even against Mark Madsen, you know, he outlanded him 68 to 39. Madsen just had some takedowns and some control time. But, um, you know, Vince put himself in a situation there. Uh, you know, if he steps a few takedowns, he's on a four fight winning streak at 41 years old. The guy's not a can by any means. His only loss outside of Mark Madsen was Gregor Gillespie by submission. Uh, Vince Pichel has some damn good wrestling. It's underrated. I mean, he's wrestled with some guys who are absolute world class. He, he's at a very high level. He averages three takedowns per fight at a 54% accuracy. And you look at a lot of these guys' accuracy, 54% you know, pretty good. He'll look for submissions on the ground as well. Um, you know, striking department, he's not the most volume in the world, uh, not the most power by any means in the world, but, uh, you know, he is good and, and defensively sound in the striking department as well as he only gets hit, you know, 2.5 significant strikes per minute is relatively low in the UFC at a 58% striking defense, which is, which is pretty damn good for the UFC caliber, um, fighters he's been fighting. So, you know, with Bonfim. Obviously lost to Benoit St. Denis. Doesn't age that bad, uh, considering BSD has been on a tear. The dude looks like an absolute nightmare for anybody he fights. It's going to be a, a way different style than Pachel. Um, but, you know, if Terrence McKinney was able to go in there against Bonfim and get that round two KO. Uh, you know, he, he as this fight draws on, I think Vince is going to have more and more success. I, I think if Bonfim isn't careful... Um, He's got to keep the adrenaline in check. He's got to keep composed in there because Vince is a dude that will be there for all three rounds in it. Let's say Vince goes out there and wrestles him in that first round and steals round one. Then then Bonfim's at a real disadvantage, and he's going to be way behind because as this fight goes on, Vince will still be there. There's chances he's probably going to take you down more times as the fight uh, progresses, and you could find yourself in a bad situation trying to find a finish to even get a win. So... Another fight I probably won't be touching, especially with Bonfim. I feel like there's so much to learn about him and even his brother still uh, before I'm comfortable laying any kind of uh, money on him. Um, yeah, I, I, I think Bonfim, you know, this is probably a, a win they're trying to set up for him. They want this guy to keep win winning. They want him and his brother at the UFC uh, at the same time together. But at the same time, man, Pichel, 7-2 and two in the UFC, 41 years old, great wrestler, tough as nails. Um, and is not a bad striker either. So it is super interesting. I think a lot of people are going to be hammering Bonfim here without looking at the full picture. And uh, don't now you come back to this if it bites him in the ass because I'm I'm just not as um, high on on this Bonfim brother as a lot of people are. Yeah, Pichel, um, I mean, seven and two in the UFC is nothing to like overlook. And being forty years old, his style of fighting is like a weird because he's kind of got this like. Stick to the outside. Hands are low. Uh, a lot of movement when he when he's fighting. I don't know if Bonfim is going to have like too much trouble with that. He seems pretty calculated on the feet. Um, but if Pichel could come out and smack him in the mouth, we saw against Benoit, like he didn't really handle that too well. Like Benoit came out with like a bunch of body kicks, and Bonfim looked like he was shell shocked. So. If Pachel can make this more of a dog fight, I like it for him, but I'm not going to go against a, a Bonfim in Brazil. Bonfim will be the pick for me. I think the striking will be a little bit cleaner. Uh, Pachel's wins don't really, they don't shock me, like, to, to the least bit. Like, Austin Hubbard, Roosevelt Roberts, no longer in the UFC. Jim Miller, solid win. Um but with the age, and he hasn't fought in a year and a half, I don't really love that for him. So Bonfim will be the pick for me. I don't love the price. But, uh, yeah, I'm not going against the Bonfim in Brazil. Bantamweight bout Daniel Marcos coming in at minus 240 against Victor Hugo coming in at plus 200 over under. Two and a half rounds plus 120 for the over minus 150 for the under. Uh, Victor Hugo. Coming off the contender series, stepping in to take on Daniel Marcos, who is still undefeated. See, the ages are similar there. Uh, the Brazilian trying to defend the home turf against the Peruvian. Who you got in this one? Yeah, I love Daniel Marcos as a fighter. Uh, against Simon Oliveira in his UFC debut, he was plus money. He was like plus 110, plus 115. And I hammered him, and he looked like he was levels above uh, against Oliveira. That kickboxing is good. His striking in general is, is super solid. Um, even against Davy Grant, like he 
probably lost that fight. I, I think that was a, a bad decision on the judges' scorecards, especially you know that fight being in London, Davy Grant's home field advantage, home crowd, everything, and they still couldn't give a, a close fight to Grant there. Shocked me. But Daniel Marcos was able to deal with some of the pressure and um, you know some of the shots he was able to eat from Davy Grant, even did some damage of his own, cut Grant open, landed some good shots. And, and against Victor Hugo, um, if he keeps this fight on the feet and doesn't do anything stupid, I, I think he'll have a lot of success against Hugo. I don't see Hugo coming out here and, and being able to compete with him on the feet. I don't see him going out there and being able to take Daniel Marcos down uh, with ease. If he if he does get to Daniel Marcos and finishes him, I do think it's some slick back take, rear naked choke uh, uh, style of finish, something where Daniel Marcos you know made a mistake and gave up the back. But I don't see him really coming out here and competing with Marcos on an MMA um, you know complete uh, game. I don't see him being on that same level just yet. I wasn't high on Hugo. You know he got that knee bar in Dana White's Contender Series, and it was slick the way he did it. I just don't know how much that type of stuff works at the UFC level. Uh, Marcos is a guy three and zero or two and zero. Sorry, one one on the Contender Series uh, so far in the UFC, and I, I think he keeps he keeps going up. His stock keeps going up. I think he finds a win here, and uh, I, I love like I said, I love watching Daniel Marcos. I'll be excited to see what he does next, and I, I definitely think he beats Victor Hugo Saturday. Yeah, Marcos' uh, UFC debut was in Brazil, so it's uh, not a different thing for him to go over there and fight. He picked up a win his last time. He's looking to do that again here. For Hugo Silva, the submission ability scares me a little bit um, because Daniel Silva or Daniel Marcos, we've seen a lot of his uh, his wins are basically you know, stand in striking battles. I don't know if the submission ability has been tested too much of uh, Victor Hugo fought. I mean, the, by the time he fights on November 4th, it'll be uh, of a month since his last fight on the contender series. So I don't know if he's just stepping in there a little bit too quickly. I mean, to fight that two fights in a month is a lot to ask. Daniel Marcos is still undefeated and he looks dang good. Uh, the one thing watching that contender series fight with Victor Hugo, like the guy he fought, was mainly a striker and uh the guy the striker was was looking for the grappling automatically gets himself into a knee bar so i don't think daniel marcos is going to be that dumb to 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 try to grapple uh victor hugo when he's got the the striking advantage daniel marcos will be the pick for me um but i wouldn't be surprised if hugo looks for the grappling early and it maybe turns into a closer fight because i don't think marcos has been tested that much uh in that realm of his game so Will be the pick, um, but yeah. Welterweight bout Hanat Fakradinov coming in at minus three twenty-five against Alizu Zaleski dos Santos coming in at plus two thirty-five. Over under two and a half rounds, minus one hundred five for the over, minus one twenty-five for the under. A lot of hype around Hanat Fakradinov. Uh, he had the big knockout into a submission win against Kevin Lee, which was Kevin Lee's return fight. Uh, he's now three and zero in the UFC. He's looked pretty dang good doing it. Aleski or Zaleski Dos Santos, thirty six years of age. Uh, he's had a long UFC career, thirteen fights. He got a win over Sean Strickland back in twenty eighteen, and uh, got a win over Benoit Saint Denis back in twenty twenty one. So both of those wins age pretty well. But he took his uh, suspension from USADA and had to take a two-year layoff, or one-and-a-half-year layoff at least. Comes back against Abubakar Nurmagomedov and gets a split decision win. Um, coming into this one, I don't really love the price on Fakradinov because Zaleski has been around for so long, and you've seen uh, the way that he can he can put it on you at times. Fakradinov, not a ton of UFC experience. Um, but the thing that scares me is like the guy, if he gets you down, like you ain't getting back up. And uh, uh, Zaleski, he's been taken down a good amount of time. 65% takedown defense in his UFC career. Um, so this one is interesting. I'm really interested to see this fight because it is a good test for Anat Fakhrudinov. Who you got in it? Yeah, it's a really good test. And so Zaleski Dos Santos being, um, you know, as old as he is, 37 or 38. 
he's still doing the damn thing. Like against Abubakar and Nurmagomedov, that line was pretty close. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of people thought Nurmagomedov was going to have a lot more success than he did. Ended up getting outstruck by Dos Santos. Um, you know, it was a it was a fairly close fight. Actually, pretty really close fight. Uh, but, you know, Abubakar was able to take him down once. Benoit Saint-Denis took him down a couple of times. Um, you know, he, he, he Lee Jingliang, when they fought, took him down twice. That kind of thing worries me, especially as he's getting a little bit older, maybe a step slower than he was five years ago. And you got Hanat Fokker-Dinov, who is just a suffocator, man. He comes in here, like, look at against Brian Battle. Brian Battle landed three punches on the course of the three rounds when they fought just because he took him down seven times and, and you know, just didn't let him breathe. And it was at the beginning of each round, Fokker-Dinov would get him down, maybe Battle would stumble up to his feet, right back to the mat, and you're controlled for the rest of the round. Fokker-Dinov landed that right hand against Kevin Lee. It was nice. Uh, he showed that you know he has a lot of power. He's got a, a bunch of knockouts on his record, as long along with the submissions. Um, well roundedness is there. Uh, you know the one thing I do worry about though is if Zaleski Dos Santos just keeps working back up to his feet and, and starts working those body kicks like he did against Abubakar, like he did against Saint Denis, uh, and, and starts to get to Hanat. Maybe Hanat thinks he's got an easier fight here. Um, you know, taking these prospects like Fakhr Dinov at big uh, favorite money like he is, you know, it, it scares me because although he's fought Kevin Lee, who was on his comeback fight, you know, probably was well washed going into that fight. Yeah, he beat Brian Battle, but we haven't seen him in any kind of adversity yet. And I hate taking guys at that price when we haven't seen how they respond to, you know, getting clipped or uh, getting tired and dragged into deep waters when your opponent's able to work back up to their feet. Just haven't seen enough yet. I do think he wins this fight. I do think he's a, a, a special talent. I think he's got all the tools. Um, yeah, I think he's got his head on straight and he really wants this. But Zaleski Dos Santos is kind of that party crasher to where if you let him hang around long enough, he's dangerous and he makes fights really, really close. And we saw that against Nurmagomedov in his last one. So, yeah, give me for Hernat Fakhradinov. Uh, I love Zaleski Dos Santos. He's always in fun fights. Um, but, yeah, I, I think it's going to be tough for Zaleski to get this one done. Yeah, Zaleski scares me in this one. Uh, I don't think I'll be laying the juice on Fakhr Dinov um, because Zaleski can make it a dogfight. Uh, for Fakhr Dinov, Fakhr Dinov's got like one of the most scariest underrated right hands. Like you're so scared about the takedown that you don't see it coming. It's super loopy, but he lands it. And when he lands it, it hurts you. Um, knocked down Brian Battle, obviously knocked down Kevin Lee. And made easy work of him. Uh, for Dos Santos, I think if he can keep it on the feet, this fight turns into probably a pick him. Uh, but I just don't know if he's going to be able to do that. Fakhradinov has a, a good way of disguising his takedowns. They're not really shooting naked takedowns. Uh, he'll usually try to gain a little bit of respect on the feet and then throw some type of overhand or, or some type of jab into a takedown. And when he gets it, he gets it pretty easily. So Fakhradinov will be the pick for me. Um, really not happy about like the juice. So I don't know. Maybe I'll look to sprinkle something on Zaleski if he can make it a dog for Or maybe look for a live betting spot and maybe you, you feel it out in the first round and see uh, where this fight may go. So, yeah. Light heavyweight bout. Modestus Bokaskis coming in at plus 170 against Vitor Petrino sitting at minus 210 over under two and a half rounds plus 115 for the over minus 145 for the under the undefeated Vitor Petrino coming in and taking on Modesto Spakowskis second stint in the UFC uh we all or most people know the know the deal blew out his leg and then uh got cut and then came back and picked up a couple wins so a good little comeback story for Bukowskis. He's getting a tough draw here against Vitor Petrino, uh, who has looked like an absolute stud in the UFC. Hasn't faced, you know, the greatest competition. He's only got two fights in the UFC. Win over Martian Pracnow and a win over Anton Tercali. Um, So going into this one, the main thing that I'm looking at is like Vitor Petrino has big power on the feet, but it seems like in his last two fights, like, he wants to prove that he's an all-around type fighter. He's looking more for the grappling. 
Got seven takedowns against Turkali, four takedowns against Martian Prakneo, and uh, he's looked fairly good doing it. The only thing that, that scares me is like, um, are you looking? It goes back to the thing. It's like, are you looking to win fights or are you looking to prove yourself? Like, which one are you going to do? I think he beats Bukowskis on the feet. I think he beats him on the ground. So Petrino will be the pick for me. Um, but if he's going in there just trying to like keep – getting better at his game instead of win the fight makes me a little scared. What are you thinking? Yeah, no, I feel the same way. Um, I think wherever this fight goes, Vitor should be the the better fighter. And to beat a guy like Vitor, Vitor Petrino, I think you got to have some special attribute. Like you've got to have a ton of power and be a good striker. You got to have an insane grappling game um, that's going to be better than his because everywhere this fight goes, Vitor has proven that he can hang. On the feet, he's got power. He's a good striker. Uh, it throws decent volume, doesn't get hit uh, that much. Uh, but against like Anton Turkali, who's a good grappler, he was taken down five times, but he worked back up to his feet each time and even landed seven takedowns of his own. Ended up getting the decision win and just showing like if you're getting taken down five times and you're getting seven takedowns of yourself in the course of three rounds, like, your cardio has got to be at least somewhat good. I mean, even against Prakniao, he, he was able to take Prakniao and, and grapple the hell out of him at UFC 290 and, and found that round three uh, submission just from wearing Prakniao down. Like, this guy has so many paths to finding finishes, to finding wins, um, compared to a guy like Bukaskis, who's kind of just a point fighter at this point. Beat uh, Zach Palga in a close fight. It's kind of just a, looked like a sparring match in there. Same thing with Tyson Pedro. Looked like a sparring match in there. Tyson Pedro was able to land a couple of takedowns on Bukaskis, um, which is another reason that leads me to believe that if Petrino wanted to, he's going to be able to grapple with Bukaskis as well. So, um, you know, in Bukaskis' first stint in the UFC, he gets KO'd, TKO'd by Jimmy Crute. Um, same thing against Khalil Roundtree. Uh, Vitor Petrino hits pretty damn hard up there with those guys as well. So I'm not going to be surprised if you see Petrino chin check Modestus Bukaskis here. I won't be surprised if you see him take him down and submit him. I won't be surprised if you see him just mix everything in there for three rounds and get a decision win either. So, yeah, I'm going to be taking Vitor Petrino here. I think it's a great parlay piece, if I'm being honest. I just don't see Bacoscus having the power to come out here and put Petrino out. And if you can't do that, Petrino's probably going to beat you. Yeah, Petrino is, a, he looks like an absolute unit. Like, the yeah. dude is, is huge, and he doesn't have a lot of fat on him. So, I think uh, Bukowskis, he's had a couple of close fights in his second stint that like aren't super impressive. Like Tyson Pedro had those health issues going into the fight. Looks like a good win, but I just don't think Pedro was really there that night. Um, and then the close fight against Palga, it's not a ton that I can really look at and, and get invested in as far as like trying to take a dog shot here. So I think Petrino wins. Um, and I, I honestly don't hate the price either. I mean, minus 210, I would have expected to be a little bit higher uh, in this fight. So, yeah, I'll take him. Strawweight bout. Angela Hill coming in at minus 105 against Denise Gomes sitting at minus 125. Over under two and a half rounds, minus 300 for the over, plus 225 for the under. The 23-year-old Denise Gomes uh, facing the 38-year-old Angela Hill who is 15 and 13 in her career and uh, two and three in her last five. She's coming in here against N Denise Gomes. I believe this is the first time Denise Gomes is going to be a favorite in her fight. She's on a back-to-back -back KO streak, picked up the big KO in her last time out against Yasmin Howergy. I think she was like nine or plus 400, somewhere around there. First round KO and then a, a second round KO against Bruna Brazil. Uh, back at the fight we were at in uh, Kansas City. So she's on a, a big streak here. Maybe that's factored into the price, but Angela Hill last time out got molly whopped by uh, Mackenzie Dern and kind of pieced up on the feet. So who are you liking in this one? Yeah, I think against uh, Mackenzie Dern for Angela Hill was like the first time we really saw the age maybe play a factor and maybe she's taking a step, you know, she's a step slower now because she beat Emily Ducote before that, beat Lupi Godinez before that. And then her losses were against Savages, Verna Jandaroba, Amanda Lemos, Tisha Torres, um, and then beat Ashley Yoder. But you look at, you know, Tisha Torres up until Mackenzie Dern, 
those are all pretty decent names. I mean, Lupe Godina is looking like a savage of late. Uh, Emily Ducote just got a win, looked decent. But everybody else, Jan Daroba, Lamos, Tor, like those are savages, and that makes me nervous. But then I watch her against Mackenzie Dern, and it's like, man, she looked off. Maybe she looked a little slower, couldn't quite find her range. And she was getting cracked by Mackenzie Dern. Like Mackenzie Dern landed a knockdown, had the knees, the elbows that were wobbling her, um, and was able to take her down three times and just do basically whatever she wanted in that fight. And then I look at Gomes, and she's just been under underestimated every single time out. Um, yeah, after Loma Luke, Luke Boon me. And since then knocks out Bruno Brazil knocks out how Um, <laughs> I mean, you don't see two, a girl go on a, a two streak knockout, um, in two separate in two fights back to back. Like you just don't see that in women's MMA. I think it speaks volumes to her power and her striking. Um, both girls are going to be near the same size. I would think Angela Hill might have a little speed advantage and a volume advantage. Um, but you know, if she leaves herself open and Gomes connects, uh, I think I think Gomes hits harder than Mackenzie Dern. I think if she finds a chin, she's going to do damage, and it's going to be a pretty uh, a pretty fun fight, at least for women's MMA. I just don't know how you bet against the Nisi Gomes at this point, especially if it's going to be against a striker, and um, you know, after she's just put out two strikers in that fashion. So, especially against the 37 year old Angela Hill. I mean, what's the stat when a, a fighter is 10 years younger than her opponent or his opponent? It's like they win at like a 60, 70 percent clip. I think maybe that's the the story here as well. I think Denise Gomes on the rise. Um, she's getting better. She's got the blonde hair this week. It's in Brazil. I mean, you can't really write a better story. I keep thinking as well. You know, the UFC wants these fighters to win who are on win streaks and knockout streaks. And what better way or bet what better name to put on your resume than Angela Hill, a girl who's fought the best of the best, been in the UFC a long time. You beat Angela Hill. And you start climbing the ranks. So, yeah, give me Denise Gomes here. And I like the prize, too. Yeah, I mean, for 23 years old, you got to figure Denise Gomes is still getting better in every aspect uh, of her game, too. So, coming into this one, the way I look at how the fight plays out is, like, Angela Hill loves to stick to the outside, use her jab, use her movement. And that, I don't know if that's going to work well against Denise Gomes because it seems like she loves to just crash the distance get in your face and uh, make it a dog fight. So I don't think Angela Hill is going to be super comfortable in there. Um, one little cheeky prop I could, could maybe see is Angela Hill's never been knocked out, but she has been submitted twice. So she's got a decent chin. I think maybe uh, Denise Gomes could crack her and maybe throw in a little submission, get her first submission win. Uh, Cause Denise Gomes in her fight against Loma Luke Boone uh, the fight that she lost, she had three submission attempts on the ground. Uh, couldn't couldn't uh, get it done on the ground, but ultimately got her in some pretty bad spots. So in this one, I think uh, Angela Hill is just a little bit outgunned, and uh, maybe the age could start showing too. I mean, she is a veteran. Maybe she has a good game plan in there, but I think Denise Gomes with the youth and uh, continuing to get better with the her all-around game, I think she just pulls it off for the win, so I'll take her. Another strawweight bout, Montserrat Ruiz coming in at plus 350 against Eduarda Mora, sit at minus 500 in her UFC debut, over under two and a half rounds, plus 125 for the over, minus 155 for the under. The undefeated Eduarda Mora uh, making her UFC debut after her submission win on the Contender Series this year. Montserrat Ruiz, two and three in her last five, um, and she... We'll be looking to spoil the party. Uh, she's not on uh, a great streak in her career. Our last time out against Jacqueline Amaram, she got thrown around and, and kind of just dominated on the ground. Uh, for Ru Ruiz's frame, she's not going to do much on the feet. Like She's not uh, a very polished striker whatsoever. Most of her game is try to look for takedowns, hold you there, uh, and use her jujitsu to to keep you there. So... In this one against Eduardo Mora, uh, the way that her grappling has looked in her career looks like it might be a tall task. I guess that's why you see the line that way. But either way, I mean, UFC debut is a little uh, minus 500 is a little tough to, to lay the chalk on that. What are you thinking? Yeah, minus 500 in, in women's MMA uh, anyways is sketchy in, in any fight. But yeah, making her debut, I hate that number. I hate that price. It gives me 
every time I see somebody making their debut um, at a, a massive favorite price like that, it gives me jazz, uh, um, uh, Jacqueline Amorum and, and Juliana Miller vibes when they're big favorites and they come in there and just shit the bed. So, but luckily for her, Montserrat Canejo, um, you know, hasn't looked good, been, been TKO in her last two fights. Um, and has the style, I think, that Amora, that Mora will be able to, to hang with at least. I mean, on the contender series, uh, you know, right away goes and gets a sub. She shows that she has the grappling. Uh, if you look at her record, like she's got five, four other submissions in that on her record. She's got some TKOs herself, pretty well rounded. And if you look at her too, she's five foot six with a 67 inch reach. Canejo, not the best striker in the world by any means, not actually not very good at all. And she's only five foot with a 61 inch reach. Like she's going to be well undersized compared to um, Mora here. And, you know, if Canejo can't go out there and get the takedown, you know, the upper body takedown and the scarf hold, she's kind of screwed. And I think Mora is going to be better than Cheyenne Vlismus. Like when she took her down and was able to just kind of hold on and, and get her in that position to land some shots. Um, I think Mora here will be able to, you know, take the back if she wants to, if this fight goes to the ground and she has her in the scarf hold, I think she's going to be able to get back to her feet. And if she wants to keep this thing on the feet, you know, using that rate reach and her good striking, she'll be able to do what she wants, especially at range. Like Kaneho, I just hate the size disadvantage here, especially when you kind of a one trick pony in the UFC, uh, you know, going up against a, a girl who's well-rounded, who's a lot bigger than you. You're on a two fight knockout or TKO losing streak. Um, I won't be surprised if we see number three here, at least her getting finished by submission or TKO. Yeah, Mora's pretty dang big for a, a straw weight too. Yeah. Um, and her fight on the contender series was against a girl that has a similar frame to Montserrat Ruiz. So I don't know. It ain't really looking good for Montserrat Ruiz, but you know, swimming's MMA. Um, and that is that's kind of her world, is the grappling world for uh Ruiz. So maybe she can hang with her. Uh, she couldn't hang with Jacqueline Amaram. Amaram has some insane jujitsu. Like the way that she was able to uh, throw around Ruiz in that fight was super impressive. I don't know if if Mora has that level of jujitsu, but she does look a lot stronger. Like the girl looks like she's off the sauce. Uh, so I would expect her to be pretty dang strong if she does get her to the ground. She's got a ton of submissions, five subs in the first round. She's got uh, three TKOs on her record. She's only been to one decision. Um, so I think she could go in there and finish her uh, very quickly uh, and make make it look like a minus 500. But at that shock UFC debut, I probably won't be touching it. She'll be the pick for me. Uh, but yeah, be cautious. Lightweight bout Mark Jacasey coming in at minus 125 against Kawi Fernandez sitting at minus 105 over under two and a half rounds minus 165 for the over plus 135. For the under, uh, Mark Jacasey, two and three in his last five. Uh, he's had a little bit of a tough go about in his last few fights. Kawi Fernandez making his UFC debut. Um, he's eight and one in his professional career. His uh, last couple fights have been in LFA, and they've both been knockouts. One head kick in the first round, and one kick to the body in the first round. So the guy is dangerous on the feet. Mark Jacasey. Never been uh, knocked out, but he's been submitted three times in his UFC career. His last time out, had a good first round against Joel Alvarez and then a little clash of heads, and he gets submitted in the second round. He's on a two-fight losing streak. Uh, looking to bounce back here, maybe save his job too. He's 7-7 seven and seven in the UFC. Not sure where his contract lines up, but he's getting a, a debuter here, so I'm kind of intrigued on the Jacasey line considering it is uh, fairly close. We know the capabilities he has with the grappling. Uh, the dude is an athlete. Like he is explosive. And honestly, like when I watch this guy fight, I watch this guy shoot takedowns. I'm like, you could be uh, an insane wrestler because this guy shoots a double leg. It's like you don't even see him coming, and you're ultimately like before you know it, you're on your back. Because he's so fast and he's so strong when he gets a gets a hold of you too. You saw that against Hajovic. You saw that against Vyacheslav Borshev. Just grappled him up, wrestled him. The only problem with that is he doesn't do a ton of uh, damage on the ground. Like he's not that type of wrestler where he can get you down, land a ton of, of damage, and get a submission. He's more of a 
explosive type of guy, gets you to the ground, holds you there, and uh, you got to work out for work out of it to to get back in the fight. So it's an interesting one to me. What are you thinking? Yeah, super interesting. And this line's coming down closer to um, even, and it kind of surprised me a little bit. I think there's a lot of recency bias with this fight, especially towards Mark Casey. Yeah, he lost to Joel Alvarez, but he was sticking to his game plan in that fight until he takes the headbutt and then gets knocked down and submitted. He was beating Joel Alvarez. Uh, the fight before that against Michael Johnson was just one that made you stop and scratch your head because there was no game plan there at all. He thought he was just going to stand and, and, and strike with Michael Johnson, gets outstruck by a mile and loses a decision. I was at that fight. I thought Mark Jacasey was going to win. I was on Jacasey there, and he didn't shoot any takedowns, and he wasn't trying to get this fight to the ground and, and do his thing. Because, I mean, you look at Demir Hadjevich, he took him down eight times and, and just suffocated him. Same thing with, uh, with Slava Claus. He took him down 11 times in that fight. Like, this guy has a phenomenal wrestling pedigree. And when he uses it, he's extremely hard to beat. He doesn't let these strikers uh, get going and get into a flow. He's constantly in their face, constantly backing them up against the cage and putting them on their backs. So if he can come in here with this game plan, I think he, he, he finds this win easy. Against Fernandez, though, like he's going to have to do it from the opening bell. Like He's got to go after him and not let him have any room to work and get comfortable in there. Because if Fernandez does, you look at his record, you watch his tape, the dude is extremely live in that first and, and, and first part of the second round. The guy holds a lot of power. Uh, the guy is an athlete, and uh, he, he's a finisher. So the one parts where he struggles, though, for Fernandez, you watch his tape, it's against wrestlers who take him into deep waters and get him tired, and you can see Fernandez really struggling in the second half of the fight, late second and, and into the third round. Jacasey has the game plan and the style and the ability to do that if he wants, but he's got to stay disciplined and composed and come in there with get that game plan and uh, just stick to it. Just quit trying to prove to people that you're a great striker. Um, just do what you do best and do what has gotten you wins inside the UFC, and you should get this win as well. And I'm going to be banking on him to do that. I think the Michael Johnson fight was probably an eye opener. He went out there and was trying to get Joel Alvarez, even got him down twice, and then, you know, unfortunate circumstances with the headbutt. But what can you do? I think if he comes out here and sticks with it, he'll beat Fernandez. Yeah, I really think Jacasey could come in here and just ragdoll Kawi Fernandez um, because I don't think he needs to strike with him whatsoever. Like, Kawi Fernandez is a solid kickboxer. You've seen it in his last two fights. Got knockout power, especially with those kicks. You don't want to like mess around with that. The only thing that scares me is like I don't know what Mark Jacasey is going to do. Like I, mm -hmm. that's the only the scary part. If I knew for a fact he was going to go in there and just just wrestle this guy, I think he should be like minus five hundred. But I don't know that he's going to do that. At minus one twenty five, it is probably worth a shot for me to take it. Uh, he'll be the pick for me. Use the takedowns. Uh, if it's a boring fight, it is what it is, but you get your win. And, uh, you know, maybe a win is what he needs to keep his his con or keep his job here with the UFC. So I'll, I'll be I'll be I'll be a little interested to see what the Fernandez by sub prop is uh, just because we've seen him snatch yeah. up guillotines and stuff like that against wrestlers before. And Casey, we've seen him lose by guillotine and uh, these these submissions before. So, you know, it might be something to sprinkle on or, or even look at because Casey. I expect him to come out there and be shooting takedowns. So um, you never know when that neck's going to get snatched. Yeah. Uh, but those are the picks for UFC Sao Paulo. 12 fights. Uh, if there's any added, uh, stay up to date for those to get broken down. But other than that, uh, you got anything else on the card? Got fights back. Had a week off. Uh, I'm locked in. I know you're locked in. It's going to be a fun week. It's going to be a good week. I can't wait for Saturday. I can't wait either. Uh, once again, if you want the, the premium bets, jump in the premium membership. Link is in the description for that. Uh, you can stay up to date with everything at the Double Leg on Instagram. We'll give out our free play there on uh, Saturday before the fights. Uh, we hit the big Saeed Nurmagomedov submission at plus 250. Last time at UFC 294, that was the free pick. So stay tuned for that. Uh, at HI Picks on the medias for me, where can they find you? All social medias at the Parlay MMA. All right, until next time, we'll be recapping some UFC Sao Paulo. Uh, good luck to everyone if you're placing bets and enjoy the fights. The Double Egg, signing off.